What's good kings and queens? Hope everyone's starting off their September well. This week's video is on Mexico's most underrated champion, the great Juan Francisco Estrada. I'm saying great because the man has already done enough to cement his career as one of the greatest fighters to come from the lower weight classes and easily one of the greatest Mexican fighters of this era. This is what I love about the lower weight classes. There is far less political BS, and you truly get to see the best fight the best. And the career of Estrada so far is a prime example of that. That being said, let's start the video. Juan was born in April 14, 1990 in Sonora, Mexico. He had a tough upbringing. He lost both of his parents at a young age, and after residing in many towns temporarily with other guardians for a couple of years, at the age of seven, his aunt took him and his siblings to raise them permanently. He picked up boxing at the age of nine through his brother Jose, and by 10, he was having his first amateur fight, completely dedicating himself to the sport, finishing his amateur career with the record of 94 and four. Most Mexican boxers start their career rather early and would rake in plenty of experience getting well needed rounds in, fighting opponents who would be a sparring partner but in an official bout. You get your experience, you get your rounds in, you're getting paid, and you receive less unnecessary wear on the body because most damage doesn't come from the fight itself but through the training camp to the fight due to hard sparring. Canelo was unofficially 44-0, officially in the record books 31-0 by the age of 19. When asked during fight week of his fight against Jose Miguel Cotto in 2009 why he went pro so early despite having a successful amateur career in Mexico, his complaint was that the amateur program there is not good. Estrada would start his pro career shortly after his 18th birthday He would rake in five fights in one year. Like I stated in previous videos, fighters in the lower weight classes are moved along very quickly. Estrada by his 17th bout, he is matched up against number 10 ranked IBF contender 11-1 Juan Carlos Sanchez. In the first round, Estrada will get knocked down for the first time in his career. Estrada will come back in the sixth, dropping Sanchez, but was unable to get the win earning his first loss by an eight round unanimous decision. Estrada would pretty much shrug this loss off and was like, dude caught me slipping, but I'll be ready next time. He literally fought two months later in July, then again in September, again in November, again on December 8th, and check this out. This dude seriously fought Sanchez in a rematch the very next weekend on December 17th to end the year off. Talk about old school. This time being a 10 round bout, Estrada got more time to warm up and get his revenge. Estrada will get knocked down for the second time in his career in round 10. It's so it seems to me the Sanchez guy is a fast starter but lacks of stamina. Estrada would rally, drop Sanchez in a 10th and final round. Sanchez gets up at 9 but is waved off. And holy crap, what a way to end your year off. Sanchez the next year would still earn a title shot. The loss to Estrada didn't affect his rankings, and he would become the IBF super flyweight champion. So for everyone's information, Estrada is fighting in two different weight classes at the same time. So for anyone to go out and claim he doesn't have a chin, that's not the case at all. At this time in his career, he was a natural flyweight, and he fought Sanchez who was a natural superfly, who would weigh in a lot heavier on fight day. So despite footage of this fight not really existing, I can't really find it at all, I can only assume that Estrada was fighting at quite of a size disadvantage both bouts. Most who comment on my videos whenever I'm talking about guys in the lower weight classes and joke about them being unknown, the 22-1 Estrada to hardcore fight fans at that time was considered virtually unknown and he was given a chance to fight at light flyweight, a class below him against the 33-0 WBA champion Roman Chocolatito Gonzalez. Now going back to old boxing scene articles in the forum comment section, no one liked this matchup. I mean, look at the comments. Look at this one here. They might as well have him go in the ring with a punching bag because whoever they put him in there with will pretty much be a punching bag anyway. Gonzalez needs to start fighting the top guys. I'm a fan, but he needs to quit the bum diet. This is the only guy who knew Estrada and had something positive to say. Gonzalez will be fighting my friend 
Juan Francisco Estrada. El Gallo just posted that on his Facebook page. El Gallo might not be all that well known outside of his native Anasco, Mexico, but he is a beast. He has been featured on TV Azteca for most of his career. No one heeded this man's words. The co-main event and the main event could have easily been 2012 by the year if Pacquiao Marquez 4 didn't happen. It was an absolute war between Brian Veloria and Tyson Marquez in a WBA and WBO unification match. Then this match between Gonzalez and Estrada being an absolute unexpected gem of a fight. Estrada shocked many putting on an absolute show. You saw the best of both guys this fight. And really without context of the build up, you would have thought this was a highly anticipated rivalry fight. Nope, not at all. Not a soul would have guessed it. Except for that guy. Champion working the body on the ropes. Good left right by Estrada. A left hook and another right. Estrada is tough. And I tell you, guys, still got hurt that time too because he was what waiting. A fight. What a fight! The fight really could have gone either way if the judging was competent. The 12th round was one of the most entertaining rounds of light flyweight history. Gonzalez would escape away with a questionable unanimous decision. That 110 to 118 scorecard pretty much sums up how bad they screwed over Estrada. He put this punch wow. together as he's going wow. down. Uppercut. Put Look at Estrada. And he's landing those punches too. All of those punches. Oh, going. the uppercut. He's not missing. Right there, he's throwing his punches. He wakes up and then I tell you what. These, these guys are fighting, as I said earlier. People are getting their money worth in. Wow. Time. Wow, the champion comes back. But this was certainly not the last you see of him. He earned a lot of respect and proved to the networks and promoters that he is a skillful, world-class, TV-friendly fighter. Gonzalez was supposed to fight the winner of Valoria Marquez. I don't know what happened there with that, but Estrada was given the rare opportunity, his very next fight, to fight in Macau, China against WBO and WBA flyweight champion Brian Valoria. So we gotta take a slight detour here. This was a weird time at flyweight. Pong Sakalak Wongjong Kam ruled the flyweight division for a very long time. He was a lineal and WBC champion, 2001 all the way to 2007, making a record 19 title defenses as a lineal champion which has not been beaten in that division till this day at flyweight. So why does this information matter? I'm getting to that. Wong Jung Kam gets dethroned by Daisuke Naito in their third fight, fails to regain it in their fourth fight due to a draw, but sits on the WBC rankings waiting for the Kamado Naito super match to play out and finish. He is guaranteed the winner. Wong Jung Kam upsets Kameda to regain the WBC and lineal title. Wong Jung Kam had been through so many wars that, that each fight seemed like it was pretty much it. Then in March of 2012, Wong Jung Kam would be dethroned by one of the most unlikeliest contenders, Sonny Boy Jaro. This was rated by Ring Magazine as 2012's upset of the year. Sonny Boy would obviously lose his next fight to Toshiyuki Igarashi that same year, making him the lineal champion, just as unlikely as Sonny Boy. With all that being said, Toshiyuki is the king of the division, and Brian Valoria coming to the Estrada fight is ranked number one by Ring Magazine. Estrada is unranked by Ring Magazine. This was the first fight I was really introduced to Estrada. Valoria would have his best moments early in the fight, but he really seemed gassed out by the third. I don't know what was up, and Estrada really did shut the critics up and beat Valoria to the punch. These scorecards really don't do justice. I had Estrada way ahead, at least up by five rounds. But 
but somehow this turned into a split decision. Luckily, the win was given to the right man, and Estrada beats the best guy at flyweight to become the WBA and WBO champion. This is a sad thing here, despite Estrada beating the number one guy, the fact that he was unranked, they didn't even put him at number one in the rankings. Roman Gonzalez had just moved up from light flyweight, put at number one, and Estrada was at number two. Estrada beat the number one ranked guy at flyweight, Brian Valoria, then in 2013 beat number four ranked 29 and 0, Milan Melindo, by unanimous decision. Melindo later became champion down the road. Gonzalez will later fight Akira Yayagashi for the lineal flyweight title, win and get picked up by HBO. <laughs> Estrada would make five title defenses of his unified crown while most fight fans were in hopes they will see a rematch between him and Gonzalez shortly after Gonzalez moved up to super flyweight and the lower weight classes was really starting to pick up to where Tom Loeffler at K2 Promotions was throwing on super flyweight dedicated cards. It was just perfect timing for Estrada. In 2017, he made his HBO debut and pretty much his Super Flyweight debut against former Super Flyweight champion 36-1 Carlos Cuadres. The winner is guaranteed a shot at the WBC Super Flyweight title against the winner of the Rungvisai Gonzalez rematch. Despite Estrada's fight with Valoria sort of being on HBO, it was one of those Macau events that came on HBO 2. It came on at odd times and the ratings were not so well in the state. This was your classic Mexico versus Mexico rivalry. The build-up reminds me of Marquez versus Barrera. Like Barrera, Cuadras was an established star in the division who had a strong promotional support to get where he is. Senbu Nihonji Sugoiski Senbu Nihon Hito Atakai Ves. Arigato Daimas. Miotara TK Oshori, so say Miotara Nihon Go Kuadra Fishnesta. Like Marquez, Estrada really had to fight his way up. He had to take the stairs from the underground parking deck to get to where he is today. And this was his big day on HBO to finally show off he is one of the best fighters from Mexico. The fight started off quickly in Cuadras' favor. I feel like Estrada really started to adjust and start to catch up in the fifth, changing the tide in the fight. The seventh will be clearly Estrada's round. Quadras will put on a great fight, but Estrada was winning the exchanges. Incredibly close, coming into round 8 and 9, it could go either way. Estrada will score a vital knockdown in the 10th, as it seemed in the 11th round, as Quadras just may have taken the round, boxing and jabbing his way to a 10-9 scoring during the second half of the round. Estrada lands beautiful combinations in the final 10 seconds to end the round off, completely stealing the round back. Harold Letterman had the fight coming to the 12th round. 104-104 a draw. Whoever wins the 12th takes it all. The 12th being really hard to judge. Quadras landing a lot of ineffective flashy shots as Estrada would purposely take them to land off two to three big counters. If you are scoring for effective aggression, you gotta give it to Quadras. If you're scoring for who is landing the more effective punches within those exchanges, you have to give it to Estrada. This is possibly the second time someone has given Michael Buffer the wrong notes to announce the incorrect results. Felix Stern versus Sam Solomon. Buffer had a Steve Harvey moment. To the winner, by unanimous decision, Aus Deutschland! Pardon me. No, ladies and gentlemen, from Australia, the winner by unanimous decision, Sam King Solomon.
Ruffer accidentally announced Quadras as the winner by unanimous decision, but the way he said it, it was Carlos Estrada. So you definitely knew there was something wrong. Buffer had to quickly make a correction to announce Estrada as the winner. He's making clear that he's upset. One of the judges is handing his card up, and now it appears that we may have a correction. I'm not certain that Michael Ladies Buffer gave it correctly. Apologies, please. My apologies. The score goes the other way. The winner, Juan Francisco Estrada. Estrada is now the WBC mandatory to fight Rungvisai. The timing of this mandatory matchup couldn't have been any more perfect. Inoue, who was ranked at number one in the division, had moved up to Bantamweight. That bumped up Rungvisai to number one and Estrada to number two in the rankings. So not only this was a mandatory title defense, but it was also a unification for the lineal title. The last lineal champion was Victor Chinian in 2011. The title went vacant after he decided to move up to Bantamweight. Estrada started the fight quick. I would say easily taking the first two rounds. Rungvisai will rally and really start to pressure Estrada and equal the rounds up. Rungvisai came in the fight with a large weight advantage and it was really starting to show as Rungvisai is completely outboxing him in the six. That extra weight was really starting to tire out Rungvisai as he tried to catch a breather and Estrada started to make his move scoring in the eighth. It was unfortunately just not enough the weight disadvantage played a role in this fight as Estrada's shots were not having any effect on Rungvisai. Both guys in the 12th would go all out and finish the fight strong. Estrada would get the best of all those exchanges, winning big. Unfortunately, Estrada will lose by a close majority decision, but you know there's going to be a rematch. Estrada would actually fight two more times to end the year off before his big rematch early that next year. This is definitely my main complaint here, and I don't know why he was on the card because that is a huge pay gap. You have a fight that is for super flyweight supremacy, the champion Rungvisai taking in 500,000, Estrada being paid 200,000. You have a bantamweight unification, TJ making 230,000 and Roman making 200,000. Then you randomly have Jesse Vargas fighting Humberto Soto who his better days were in the mid 2000s not the 2010s and a non-title 10 round tune up for 1.2 million. This dude who is not the main or the co-main event by the way is making just 100,000 shy of the total combined purses of the main cards. Wow. Just wow. And this is why I do what I do. This is why I do my absolute best to promote and speak the good word about the lower weight classes because this is ridiculous. With all that being said, Estrada didn't really do anything wrong the first fight, so there wasn't really much to change besides coming in heavier, or I'm not sure, but maybe there was a hydration limit clause or something in the contract. I don't know what the fight day weight was for the rematch, but Estrada looked far less smaller compared to Rungvisai. I don't know what Rungvisai's game plan was coming into the fight. He tried to do the complete opposite what he did in the first fight. Dude was fighting in an orthodox stance when he's a southpaw and gave Estrada trouble in the southpaw stance. And my gosh, Estrada saw that and just tore this guy up. Estrada was sharp putting on a show. Don't get me wrong, it was an exciting fight. Rungvisai did have his moments every now and then, but Estrada was landing cleanly 6-1. to one of Rungvisai's. That was pretty much the pattern the whole fight. Rungvisai finally reverted back to southpaw in the 10th round and had success, but it was obviously not enough. I mean, this looks like a different fight, and it's round 11. They said go left-handed in round 11. And I think it's more because Estrada's standing more flat-footed. He's willing to trade with a bigger puncher. I don't understand. Why would he go back? I mean, in the last, he had the best output in the 11th round, fighting Southpaw. It completely switched the fight around. Estrada looks different even facing him. And now he goes back again. Some success in the 12th, but Estrada finished the fight strong and wins by a close unanimous decision to become the WBC and lineal super flyweight champion. But he's number one in this division and everything now goes through him. He's fought the best, he's lost to the best, and he's beaten the best. This though, 
is the career win. Estrada would make a homecoming title defense to end the year off against D. Wayne Baymon, stopping him in the ninth round. So coming into 2020, what's next for Estrada? Rungvisai is currently ranked number one by ring and by the WBC. Number two in the WBC rankings, you have three division world champion Kosei Tanaka, who moved up in early 2020. Roman Gonzalez, who won the WBA title not too long ago, is ranked number two by Ring Magazine. At number three in the rankings, four division world champion Kazuto Ioka, but he has to fight WBO mandatory Kosei Tanaka. If the Roman Gonzalez unification rematch can't be made, I can definitely see him unifying against number four ranked Jerwin Ankahas. All these matchups have fight of the year nominee written all over it. Stylistically, no matter who Estrada fights, you're going to get one good fight. The super flyweight division for the past five years has really been looking like the super featherweight division when Morales, Barrera, Marquez, and Pacquiao were fighting. It is something truly, if you are a big fight fan, you just cannot miss out on. There's a golden age of talent from Bantamweight to Lightfly. You got some great matchups. And I hope one day these networks wake up because they are missing out and they have the power to make it happen. If Showtime was able to make Americans care about the super middleweight division, I am positive these networks can do the very same with the lower weight classes. And on top of that, this is the career so far of the great Juan Francisco Estrada. For more videos like these, be sure to like, share, and if you're new, subscribe. Follow me on Instagram for more video updates, boxing news, memes, edits, whatever. I'm Olfus Hancho, and I'm out.